It's been a ride. I've been telling people it feels like a fever dream. I keep remembering things that happened. Like, oh my God, that happened. Oh my God, that happened too. Behind the scenes of the writer's strike, the new president of the Writers Guild of America East takes you inside the five month fight that led to a landmark contract. Next on A Third of Your Life. You spend a third of your life at work. We're all about making it better. This is the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations podcast. The Writers Guild of America hit the picket lines in May, demanding fair pay, minimum staffing, and regulations on artificial intelligence. The strike brought film and television productions to a halt. But now it's over, and the writers are celebrating a landmark contract. Susan Sherman, a distinguished professor in the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations, sat down with Lisa Takeuchi Cullen for an inside look at what happened. Lisa is a 1992 Rutgers graduate, a screenwriter with credits on shows such as Law & Order SVU, and she is the president of the Writers Guild of America East. Now on A Third of Your Life, Susan Sherman and Lisa Takeuchi Cullen. So Lisa, I want to welcome you to our Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations podcast. It's called A Third of Your Life. I know you know what that means. <laughs> and I want to congratulate you. I want to give you a huge congratulations on a 99% member ratification of your new contract after a five-month strike. Thank you. We are so proud. Not surprised, but extremely proud. We also had an extraordinary turnout. As you know, it's hard to motivate um, voters to actually press those buttons. And uh, we had an over 70% turnout of our eligible uh, member voters. So we're, we're very happy with this, uh, with these results. Oh, I can imagine. And I also want to congratulate you on uh, being the newly elected president of the Writers Guild of America East. I refuse to accept your congratulations. I will accept your condolences. <laughs> well, I, that was my next question. How does it feel? It feels like a lot. And I'm already carrying a lot. So I'm not going to lie. Um, it feels a little bit like I lost at musical chairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, look, it's two years. I can do anything for two years. Yeah, so we'll get to that. We'll get to a little more of that in a second. First, I want to just tell you that you know, many of the listeners to this podcast are our students and faculty in our school, but we also have students from, you know, lots of other Rutgers programs, and we have listeners from union members and leaders around New Jersey, around the country, and then Rutgers Today, of course, is a huge audience for this. But I would say everybody that I know that's connected to, to labor relations has been following your strike from the beginning. You know, we were on strike here at Rutgers right about the time you went on strike. So place I'd like to start is, I call it, the pundits were wrong. You know, at the beginning, they were all saying that your demands were unrealistic, you were headed for failure, et cetera, et cetera. And Lisa, you are a famous and renowned storyteller. You've written novels, you've written scripts for shows like, for example, Law and Order, SVU. So now that it's over, thinking about it, how would you tell the story of the strike? What would be some of the key scenes in your mind? I was just thinking about this because we're going to celebrate at the Writers Guild of America East with our army of 105 strike captains who were the true heroes of this story. They rose up out of seemingly nowhere. Many of them had never before been to a single guild function. And suddenly they were getting up at two and three in the morning and riding the subway out to Queens or the Bronx, uh, sometimes to New Jersey, uh, to Rhode Island, Boston, Pennsylvania, I think I counted seven states where we picketed, and they were uh, suddenly 24-7 raging for their union, and, and it, was, it was a remarkable 
site. Um, something that we never expected going in. I think there are a hundred stories to tell, probably a thousand stories, maybe a million stories to tell about this strike. And because we are a union of storytellers, I can only imagine that many of our members will find a way to tell those stories. But I think the story of the captains is one story. I think the story of the studios grossly, grossly miscalculating is another story. I think uh, another story is the group of us uh, in leadership, the negotiating committee, who went back time and again to the table to uh, to fight this fight on behalf of our uh, almost 12,000 members. I think that's another story. I think the story of other unions rallying behind us and joining us on the picket lines and refusing to cross our picket lines and shutting down productions, I think that is a truly chill-inducing story. I just got chills just saying that again. It it it's been it's been a ride. It's been five months. I've been telling people it feels like a fever dream. I keep remembering things that happened, like, oh my God, that happened. Oh my God, that happened too. And it's hard to even believe that we've survived it, that we've moved on, and now you know we're we're back at work because it it really does feel like a lifetime. Well, I think we were all just amazed at the support and the unity that you received from the other unions. And then, of course, when SAG-AFTRA went on strike, the two unions together. And I know, because I've been following this for many years, this has not always been the case among the broader labor movement, but certainly in the entertainment unions in general. I don't think for your last Writers Guild strike it happened. That strike was in 2007 and 2008, and I was not in entertainment at the time. I was still a, a print journalist working for, you know, Time Magazine. And uh, but but I hear tell from um, my colleagues in the guilds that it was a, a completely different story. Uh, we did not get the support we got this time from our colleagues in the Teamsters or in IATSE or in sag After. I mean, they had their own you know uh, issues to deal with. It's not that they owed us anything, but uh, but the support that we received this time was unprecedented. I remember talking to you and a couple others early on, and I was impressed at the lengths you all went to to try to minimize the negative effect of your strike on, for example, the IATSE members and the the Teamsters, et cetera. How did you come to that conclusion? One of the more um, harrowing stories of the strike was that we necessarily, by withholding our labor affected the labor of others who aren't even in our union. Um, Starting with the support staff, uh, people who are emerging writers, uh, almost all of them plan to become writers or are writers already, they just haven't gotten into the Writers Guild, uh, to the crew who work in production on our television shows and movies. And we knew that by withholding our labor, we would be essentially um, withholding paychecks for our colleagues. And that was a terribly heavy burden for those of us who were making these decisions. We were in close coordination with the leadership of those guilds to the point that when we went in for our first day of in-person negotiations, with the Alliance of Motion Pictures and Television Producers, the AMPTP, which is the organization that represents the studios, we walked into our caucus room in the Sherman Oaks Galleria, where they have their headquarters, and there was this woman, and she was tall and gorgeous. She looked like a movie star. I thought, you know, and then she was very polished. I thought, is she a studio executive? Who is she? Why is she here? And then she took off her suit jacket and her arms were covered in tattoos. And one of them was of Jimmy Hoffa. And she was the representative for the Teamsters in LA. (laughs) Lindsay Daugherty is her name. And she is a star. If you are on Twitter, no doubt you've come across her. But she came in in person, as well as Duncan Crabtree Ireland, the uh, executive director of SAG After National, in person to our caucus room to signal their unity and solidarity with us. 
So we knew right from the get-go that this was going to be different, that we had their support, even though we were going to cause them headaches as well. And so what we've tried to do in the meantime, as we continued a strike that I think none of us expected it to go that long, was to try to support our uh, union sisters and brothers with food drives, with fundraising. There's a, a wonderful organization that you may be aware of called the Entertainment Community Fund, it used to be called Actors um, Fund. And uh, it has uh, money available for anybody in entertainment, anybody who works in entertainment. There are you know, grants to help people. There was a grocery fund started by a WGA member in the West named Joel Gar Garfinkel. It was uh, truly extraordinary how you know all of labor in entertainment came together to try to support each other through this strike. Well, clearly, there's been a huge payoff. I want to start with what is getting by far the most attention, and that is your language on artificial intelligence. It's clear you won some pretty important language on the use of AI. In fact, there's a recent piece in The Guardian that praises the terms you got because it puts AI, AI under the control of writers, meaning complementary to the humans, not an automated technology and therefore maybe a model for other industries. And there's a quote that I love from one of your colleagues who said, we didn't protect ourselves against the technology. We protected ourselves against the humans on the other side of the table who are trying to screw us every day. And I know that many of us professors are worried about the same things. You know, are the colleges and universities just gonna use AI to develop curricula and deliver courses online? How did you all in the Writers Guild arrive at such a smart approach when so many others were just focused on the, the quote unquote science fiction version? I think your question um, at the start of this conversation about the stories of the strike, I think the AI story is one that will resonate for many years to come. AI was not even on our radar when we first started talking. It was uh, a vague and distant threat, we felt. There were a few nerds on the committee who kept bringing it up. And the rest of us felt like it was a, it was a tomorrow problem. But the problem with tomorrow problems when you're negotiating a, a three-year contract is that tomorrow is right around the corner and then you don't have a chance to renegotiate for another three years. So our excellent staff, um, as well as our really dedicated members of the negotiating committee. Some of them just rolled up their sleeves and got to work trying to figure out an approach that made sense. And right from the start, the writers were clear that we were not going to ban AI. That was not the goal because AI was already here. It was not as though we felt like we could raise our fists in the air and stamp our feet and make this new technology go away. It's not going to go away. It, like I said, it's already here. So how could we put up guardrails that would protect our members, both in the, their working conditions as well as their compensation? And that's what we attempted to do. What we got enshrined in this contract is that a writer has to be a human. And that sounds ridiculous. It, it, it makes people laugh, but it is what we had to actually put in language that the writer of a script has to be a human. The original source material has to be from a human. So even if, for instance, a studio came up with an AI generated idea or spat out a very bad script, they could not, as they were trying to do before negotiations, go to a screenwriter, for instance, and say, here, take this really shitty script. Am I allowed to curse? I, I, I'm, I'm going to. Um, take this shitty script and we'll pay you at the lower rate of a revision to make it into an actually producible script. And then, you know, we'll, we'll figure out the credit situation later. That can not happen. Um, the writer, the human writer has to get the credit the human writer has to have the control over the script. And the human writer, importantly, can use AI. They have to work in concert with the studio and figure it out. But if it's a tool that is useful for writers, then it is not one that we wanted to take away. However, we wanted to make sure that 
all parties understood AI to be what it is, which is a machine. It's a program that responds to human prompts. You need a human. You need a human to do the work that we do. And that's what we got enshrined. To me, that's inspirational because I think that's exactly the way we in higher ed uh, ought to be thinking about it as well. I wanted to just turn to one of the other, really, I think, huge wins that you obtained that's kind of been overshadowed by the AI story, and that is the progress you made on residuals. My sense going into the bargaining was that was one of the biggest issues on the table. Yes. Residuals are essentially royalties. Um, so television and screenwriters, you know, create a product and when it goes on to success and continues to make even more money for our studio employers, then we have traditionally received a, a small slice of their success. For instance, if, um, you know, a Law & Order uh, episode is shown overseas, or if an episode replays on, you know, a cable network, then the writer, as well as other creative participants, would receive a check in the mail uh, months later. And those checks are for writers and for actors absolutely life-saving and career-sustaining, because we do not work like regular nine to five people do. We don't have jobs that continue throughout the year. We work in term employment. So we are employed for chunks of time. If you're on, if you're lucky enough to be on a broadcast television show like Law and Order, it might be a 40 week term, but those jobs are going, you know, the way of the dinosaurs. More often these days, you are hired to work for 20 weeks at a time. 10 weeks at a time. I once worked for a three week mini room. And then, so what do you do for the rest of the time that you're unemployed? Those residual checks absolutely pay the rent, pay for groceries, kept writers and actors afloat. But as television moved into streaming, the same formula for uh, residuals did not follow. So you saw on social media, Actors, for instance, from Orange is the New Black posting residual checks. That's a massive, massive show for Netflix, as you know, residual checks for two cents, three cents. That was literally the checks that we were getting in the mail, like a fraction of the cost of the stamp <laughs> to send the check in the first place, which <laughs> was just, you know, insult upon injury. So uh, we needed to uh, to change that formula. And we were able to do so. Uh, we got better uh, residuals for streaming. Um, we also got a formula for success so that if your show, for instance, is a Bridgerton, uh, a massive, massive global hit for your, uh, your streaming platform, then you see a bonus to reward that success uh, so that the people who write on those shows see some uh, as they would if they wrote on a you know broadcast show that was a hit and was replayed time and again, um, that this was our, our way of uh, addressing that discrepancy. I know a lot of uh, folks that I've talked to who don't have as much familiarity with the, the kind of entertainment business, particularly TV and film. Could you just describe a little bit about what is a writer's room? How does that work? A writer's room is a group of WGA writers who are contracted to uh, work on a, a television series. They convene every day. It's a job like any other, uh, uh, typically in person, but you know, since the pandemic, often uh, also over Zoom, and they come up with the episodes that make up the show. You know, every room is different, but you know, you might start out. Uh, sort of blue skying or brainstorming, you know, what the overall show looks like. Who are these characters? What, you know, where are the storylines going to go? And then you start breaking down, okay, what does episode two look like? Because episode one has typically already been written by the creator and showrunner and it's already sold. So what does episode three look like? And then typically we break out into either separate rooms or the writer of the episode, you know, goes off to write their episode. And those are, uh, like I said, term employment jobs. So they are finite. They last for a certain amount of time and then, uh, and then they end. So that's why when I watch a series, I notice that there's a different writer listed in different episodes. Yes. And I'll tell you a behind the scenes fact is that 
it almost always doesn't matter who the writer who is named on that script is. For many, many shows, it is a collaborative effort. So television is a collaborative writing uh, medium and your name may or may not be on the script, but you might have come up with the key turning point in that plot. Uh, you may have come up with a perfect dialogue that you remember uh, from that episode. Um, but, you know, but TV writing has always been a team effort in America and what we have won in this contract will make sure that it remains so. So I remember, Lisa, a couple of times, uh, a couple of years ago when I was doing some work with you all, that we had to postpone some meetings because you had to go out on the shoot when they were filming one of the uh, episodes of a show you were writing for. So that is the production end of uh, television writing and producing. And that is another very important key aspect of the job that we were also able to protect with this new contract. So writers for television, uh, not as much for screen, although sometimes, but writers for television are also producers, meaning that we go to set. We go to the production and we make sure that the story is being told the way that the showrunner, who is the boss of the entire enterprise, wants. So we sit there with our scripts. We make sure the dialogue's correct. If an actor has a problem, they don't feel that their character would be performing in, in this particular way, would react in this way to, to this other actor saying this, then you have to work it out with the director. You know, what's the proper response to that? There are always a million and a half problems, issues, you know, new situations, ideas that come up in the midst of production. And the writer traditionally has always been there to help navigate those changes. And with the advent of streaming, that was going away. And the reason for that is that these writers rooms for streaming were so much shorter and the episode orders were so much shorter, right? So whereas a typical uh, season of Law & Order might have 23, 24 episodes, a, a show on Netflix or Hulu might have 10 episodes or eight or six. So the rooms, the writer's rooms were ending long before the production actually began. So the writers had already been disbanded and they weren't being paid to come back and produce their episodes. One of the reasons that that is a problem for the future of our industry is that we are not training the next generation of showrunners. So I know writers who are longtime members of the WGA, they've been in half a dozen writer's rooms and they've never been to set. So they don't know, they've never experienced a key portion of their jobs. And so what we demanded and we got was a guarantee that the showrunner could keep on a couple of the writers so that they too could go to set and they could produce their episodes. Wow. It kind of sounds like most of the key things that you went in demanding where you were told were unreasonable, you got, or at least got something that will help you going forward. We really did. They... <laughs> they told us never on so many of our demands. They told us we would never get minimum staffing in writer's rooms. They told us we would never see success-based residuals in streaming, uh, that we would never have guaranteed 13-week contracts for our uh, colleagues who work in comedy variety in streaming. Uh, there were so many nevers that we flipped in this negotiation. What I dearly hope is that our union brothers and sisters and other entertainment uh, unions will take these wins and run with it in their own contracts too. Let me get you to think ahead a little bit now, uh, Lisa, thinking about your two years as president of the WGA East. What do you think your top priorities will be? I have an agenda. <laughs> You're here. You'll be shocked to hear. No, uh, I um, I never wanted this job. Um, and you know that uh, because you and I talked about it. And a wise person whose name rhymes with Sue Sherman once told me that great leaders aren't the ones who seek the role. Uh, they're the ones <laughs> who find themselves stuck 
uh, in a game of musical chairs, having lost, and you know perhaps reluctantly <laughs> take the role, uh, but then you know do everything they can to help their fellow members. That has always been my uh, my north star uh, is to help my fellow members. Um, I'm not interested in what people might imagine a union leader benefits from, um, like perks or, I don't know, a, a seat at the table uh, at giant union conferences. I frankly don't give a shit about the bells and whistles of a job like this. I can only approach it through my own prism, which is only to see what I can do to help my fellow members. Um, and my colleagues in this effort are my counsel. And for your listeners uh, who likely don't know this, um, Sue Sherman saved my union. I don't think that we can say otherwise. Um, the Writers Guild of America East was in a terrible predicament a couple of years ago where we had organized in a brand new jurisdiction without a strategy for how to care for these new members, how to assimilate them, how to adjust our traditional members uh, to the, the changes in our union. And the leadership was at each other's throats. We were headed off of a cliff. And I personally was 100% certain, I was 99% certain that the Writers Guild of America East would end, that we would uh, we were facing dissolution. But with the help of Sue and Susan Davis, her lawyer friend who brought Sue in, a wonderful uh, labor lawyer and leader, we found our common interests. And that common interest turned out to be the welfare of our fellow members. Each of us no matter what our background was and no matter how we thought we could do it best, each of us are here in leadership because we feel that we can improve the lives of our fellow members. And nobody, not a single person in leadership was there with a nefarious purpose. Everybody thought that they could help. And that's why we were all there. We had different ideas of how to do it, but we, we thought we could help. And so we went through a referendum with our entire membership where we voted on some, some guardrails to help our very different member sectors get along and move into the future together. So with that in place, we were able to move forward. And I believe that set us up for our success here in the East anyways, um, in this strike, because we had truly remarkable support from our uh, sister sectors um, in online media, which is what we call digital journalism, and in our broadcast news uh, sectors. Those uh, union members who were not on strike because their employers are not part of the, the AMPTP, the studio network, they came out in support of us uh, on the picket lines. Uh, they are, for the most part, journalists, so they express their support uh, through their, their mediums. They were supportive of us at the council table, and we came together in a way that I could not have foreseen two years ago. And I think that we are a different union now. Um, the Writers Guild of America East, I feel, has been through fire again and again, and we've come through stronger. Um, we've risen from the ashes, and we have you to thank. Well, I appreciate that. And I know that Susan Davis will, when she listens to that, also appreciate it. But I will say, because I've, I've done a certain amount of this work, as you may know, I was the mediator that uh, helped SAG and after it emerge. I've learned over the years, it takes some people stepping forward uh, to make this happen. And you all had that. I know that it was a team effort. Chris Kyle, who is our secretary treasurer, is uh, the brains um, behind the operation. Maybe I'm the heart. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, and of course, you know, Michael Winship, our president, who has just stepped down, um, has been a steadfast presence for us uh, in this guild for many, many years and truly, truly deserves more than anyone this peaceful retirement that I hope he gets from from Guild Matters. But also our council, you know, we we started in a place, and I'm sure many of your labor listeners can understand too, 
where, you know, where leadership was splintered and there were factions and there was a great deal of mistrust. Um, Sue, you, you and Susan talked often of trust and our lack of it <laughs> um, at, at the at the table. And it's been a slow rebuild. But, you know, I'm here to say if there are other folks listening from other unions going through something like this right now, that it can be done. It takes a tremendous amount of work and buy-in and, you know, sort of a, an emotional breaking down <laughs> of the stories that that we tell ourselves, right? Like the, I think that that was, you know, one of the conversations I distinctly remember having with you, Sue, is, you know, I told you, like, it felt like a religious conversion for me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when, you know, you told me, you just have to think of it a different way. And, uh, and it was like my brain broke, because I had been so set in my thinking. And, you know, my, um, uh, if I'm, you know, being honest, my, my anger over what had happened, what had been allowed to happen to this guild that I loved, that, you know, when I was able to let that go, I think, you know, I was finally able to embrace the future. I just want to comment, because we do have listeners that are from a lot of different unions. I would remind them that your union, most of the entertainment unions, like some others, like our own union here at the faculty, the council, the, the the governing body of the union are all volunteers. We are not paid. I know some unions have paid leadership from their, their members, but our member leaders are 100% volunteer. So the time that you have spent is your own time. And that leads me to ask a question about time, because I know a lot of our our listeners have been thinking a lot about this general topic. We call it work-life balance. And so thinking ahead for your presidential term, your writing career, your family life, do you have any advice on work-life balance? No, but if you do, I would be very happy. <laughs> I, I am the last person. I'm a mother. I have two teenage daughters. Uh, for anybody out there with teenage daughters, you know the pain and the suffering. Um, it it was a a life changing summer for me in many ways. These last five months felt like five years, and it it shows on my face and probably inside my body and my organs. It's no small thing to raise human beings and to hold a full-time career and to volunteer your time for a cause that you really care about. I wish that I had a formula. I wish I had a secret for how to do so without a complete you know, self-implosion. I'm mindful of the fact that I'm only the third woman in this role. In 69 years, of my guild. I am the first person of color and the third um, woman to take this job. And I have no doubt that the dearth of women, the dearth of minorities in the entertainment business has a whole lot to do with privilege and uh, the, the needs of other obligations like raising a family, like the inability to up and move to LA and to start at the bottom rung of a ladder with a job that, you know, pays $20 an hour and occupies 20 hours of your day. I did not have that path. I had a very strange path into uh, television writing. I was, like I said, a, a print journalist. And then, you know, weekly news magazines, print weekly news magazines, it turned out weren't going to be around forever, which sounded apocryphal back then, but look now. And I stumbled into TV writing and I got very, very lucky. I don't live in LA. I live in New Jersey. My husband is a classical musician uh, who works, you know, on Broadway and Broadway is in New York, not in L.A. And like I said, two very needy children. <laughs> um, and I've been able to find a career in something called development, which is the part of the industry where we come up with ideas for television shows and we pitch them and we're paid to write them. I'm very, very fortunate to have something called an overall deal which is a, a salaried job from a studio. Mine is Universal Studios. And they pay me to do exactly that, to come up with TV shows. And then, uh, like you mentioned, Sue, uh, the time we were working together or sometimes to work on you know, their shows. 
And it's, it's a lot like just that is a lot. And so why do, why do we volunteer? Um, it's something I've thought a lot about, especially as I recruit people into leadership who are, as I am in the thick of their careers. When I first joined the council uh, seven years ago, it was made up almost entirely of people who had already achieved great success in television and screenwriting and broadcast news and uh, who were really in retirement or near retirement and could therefore afford to donate their, their time in service of their guild, which is remarkable. But I also felt strongly that you had to kind of be in the job to understand the problems of the job. And I've worked hard over the years to make our council reflect that um, and pulled people in from, you know, from comedy variety, from episodic television, from screenwriting. And then now we're lucky, I believe, to have our digital media friends who are demographically younger and more diverse and who are hustling. Everybody in leadership is hustling. Nobody is kicking back at this point. So I believe that we're all in it together. You know, we're all <laughs> suffering together um, sometimes in our volunteer jobs. They are truly full-time um, for me, especially as an officer. It, it really is like having two full-time jobs. One is paid very well, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, very fortunate to say, but the other is not paid at all and is sometimes the even bigger time suck and certainly the bigger headache. So why do we do this? And I, I do think that it's, I'm, I'm not Jewish myself, but I love the word a mitzvah. I think that those of us who do this work are called to it. And um, maybe we don't do it forever. Um, in my case, I hope to do it for two years and then out. But I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a, a gift and a blessing and we should regard it as such. That kind of points me to, I think, my final area that I want to get you to talk about, and that is Rutgers University. You are a Rutgers graduate. In fact, uh, you wrote for the Daily Targum while you were here. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of our students, um, I know from my own classes and from hearing from my colleagues, that we have a lot of students from other Rutgers disciplines who are certainly hoping for careers in the broad entertainment industry, either in, you know, of course, our athletes in sports, but a lot of our others in TV, uh, uh, films, podcasting, et cetera. So as a very successful writer of journalism, novels, and scripts, do you have advice for our young people? I think that creative careers are noble, I think that they're worthy of our best and brightest. I also think that they're extremely difficult. And coming from a world like Rutgers, I think you have to prepare in a certain way. One is that it is a giant state school. And if you're like me, I, mean, I don't think anyone there is like me. Um, I came from Japan. Um, I was born and raised in Japan. And I seem to stumble into a lot of my big decisions in life, but I stumbled into Rutgers. <laughs> um, and I had no idea how big it was. I had, I believe, about 48,000 uh, students at the time. I had no idea that there was more than one campus. I had never been to campus. And uh, I had to find my way. And I literally took a wrong turn into an office one day and someone said hi are you here to join the newspaper and i said um i didn't think so but um, but what 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 do you need and uh, and that was how i joined the daily targum purely by accident but the daily targum is where i found my home and i think a lot of people at rutgers eventually say the same, the lucky ones say the same, right? Where they find the peace of that world that is home to them. And it could be Greek life for you. It could be a club. It could be your academic discipline. Um, it could be a job. Those worlds do exist. As for finding success in a high barrier to entry industry world like Hollywood, I do think that it is harder 
for folks coming out of a school like Rutgers than for, say, a school like Harvard that has a built-in network of people who already are in those jobs and can help you. There is an organization called Harvardwood where they connect alumni to uh, students who are trying to break into Hollywood. And this is something I feel very strongly about. We're not going to change the culture of Hollywood, the exclusivity of it, the lack of diversity of it, until we break those walls down. I think that if someone like me who went to a state school, who grew up overseas, who came from a different industry altogether, can manage to break in, I hope that if any of your listeners are thinking about this path, that they realize they can too. They're going to have to work harder. It's just a fact. If you're a woman, if you're a minority, if you're LGBTQ, if you belong to any sort of marginalized community, you're going to have to work harder. That's just the fact. We haven't changed the world or Hollywood certainly enough for it to become easier for you. Uh, the good news is that those those cracks uh, do exist. Um, you can find a toehold. You can work your way in. It's going to be really, really hard. And uh, the step by step of it is a whole nother conversation that I'm happy to have another time. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but for me, Rucker has made me who I am. I cannot imagine doing what I do today, you know, standing in front of hundreds of people and picking up a, a megaphone and shouting about solidarity. <laughs> um, I can't imagine having the balls to do that. Had I not been a 17 year old from Japan who showed up uh, at a college campus where I had never been before and somehow survived it. If you can survive a gigantic state school like Rutgers, I think you can survive anything. I would say amen to that. I had a not dissimilar experience at my first job interview coming to Rutgers. And I think that's just such terrific advice for our students and for some of our new faculty. Listen, it's been terrific. For that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to A Third of Your Life, the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations podcast. For more information on our academic programs, faculty, and research, visit smlr.rutgers.edu.